Hey folks, as some of you know, I am a big pro wrestling fan, and last night was the first episode of All Elite Wrestling's brand new weekly Saturday night show, Collision. I watched it, I had some thoughts, I made some notes, and here they are. So the show begins with a promo from CM Punk. He has finally returned to the company after nearly a one-year layoff. I think it wound up being about nine or ten months. Um, most of that was due to him actually being injured and having to rehab a, 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 a torn tricep, I think it was. But there was also a lot of backstage stuff that happened. He got into a fight with several of the other wrestlers, and he had just given a press conference where he talked a lot of shit about a lot of people that work for the company, like as a shoot, not just as part of, not as part of a wrestling angle. Like he was, you know, telling the truth and making a lot of people very uncomfortable and making a lot of people look very bad. Um, so this was his first time back on TV since then. And great promo from CM Punk. I thought it was terrific. He refers to a lot of that real life stuff. Um, and to his heat with the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega and Adam Page uh, without talking about it directly. And by doing it that way, he doesn't alienate the casual viewers who don't know or care about stuff that goes on behind the scenes. I know a lot of times internet wrestling fans like myself, people who are really hardcore into it, forget that there's a huge segment of wrestling fandom who just watch the shows. And then when the wrestling show is over, they go do something else with their lives. Like they're not thinking about wrestling after the wrestling show is over. It's just a thing they watch because they enjoy it. And that's it. So a lot of the fans don't really know or care about the backstage stuff. So punk crafted his promo in such a way that he was talking about it, but not talking about it so directly that people who don't know about it or don't care would feel left out. So it, it didn't remind me of like a late stage WCW shoot promo, right? Where in, in the final year or so of WCW, you would see wrestlers come to the ring on national TV and talk about stuff that had never been mentioned on the TV show that only internet wrestling marks knew about. And there's, you know, thousands of people in the arena there just sitting on their hands, looking at each other, not knowing what the hell, you know, Billy Kidman is talking. Why is Billy Kidman mad at Hulk Hogan? Like, we have no idea. Nobody knows because it's purely an online thing that they chose to make a thing on the show without any kind of setup or explanation at all. So Punk's promo did not do that. He was angry. He was funny. He was defiant. He was feeding off of the crowd, which was his hometown crowd. They were in Chicago. Um, he was thanking the people for supporting them while also challenging them and provoking them. He said that uh, if anybody in the crowd thinks that he owes them an apology, then here's his apology. He's sorry that the only people softer than them are the wrestlers they like. Again, saying some of these things that without without coming across fully as a heel, he was just he was himself. He was angry. He was defiant. He was CM Punk. He was saying, hey, I'm me. I'm the top star in this company. And tell me when I'm telling lies. And the truth is, whether you like him or not, I happen to like him quite a bit. But whether you like him or not. It's true. He is the biggest star in the company by quite a ways. Um, so, you know, you can hate him, you can like him, but you can't deny the fact that he's the, he's the biggest star in the top draw in the company. And he set some stuff up, again, not explicitly, but through hints and through references to working with MJF again. MJF is currently the AEW world champion. MJF and Punk have actual history on the show in front of the camera, not behind the scenes. And MJF versus CM Punk, it makes sense because that's really the only match the company can put together right now um, that is uh, big enough to headline their Wembley Stadium show that they have coming up at the end of August. Uh, so if that is indeed the plan to start building to Punk versus MJF for the world title in the main event of All Out at Wembley Stadium uh, at the end of August, that's a very smart decision. And this seems to be the start of that. So that was terrific. And then cut to the end of the show, the main event was CM Punk wrestling for the first time in nine or 10 months. It was him in a six-man tag with FTR versus Samoa Joe, Juice Robinson, and Switchblade Jay White. Crowd was absolutely nuclear. The crowd was great all night. Chicago is one of the only remaining legitimately great wrestling cities where you can just count on having a great crowd every single time. 
And of course they were super hot for punk. Uh, the match was really well laid out. They made the people wait for the Punk versus Samoa Joe segments because Punk and Samoa Joe have so much history. And it has been, I think, close to 20 years since they've actually been in the ring together. So this moment, the Joe versus Punk stuff in the match especially was really well done and felt like a big deal. And they worked like they have real animosity towards each other. Like they really don't like each other. And, and there's a lot, there was a lot of aggression between them in their segments. Finish was really good. Uh, Joe has Punk trapped in the Coquina clutch, his finishing hold, his submission hold. Punk uh, looks like he's fading. He's going to be forced to tap out or pass out. FTR are trying to get in to break it up, but Juice and uh, Switchblade are holding them back. And then finally they break free and they're able to, uh, to, to save Punk. And then eventually, uh, like a minute after that, uh, Joe tags out. Juice tags in and ends up getting pinned. He takes uh, FTR's finish and then gets to his feet and takes Punk's finish to go to sleep and gets pinned. And that's the end of the match. Good finish. I didn't like the fact that in order to break free from Juice when he was holding him back, uh, Cash Wheeler hits Juice with a tornado DDT on the outside of the ring. And then within a few seconds, Juice has to get up from that devastating move back on his feet and run back to his corner so he can get tagged in by Joe to take the fall for the finish. That felt a little wrong to me. Um, but in terms of the drama and the anticipation, uh, especially with the build up to the save to get Punk out of the submission hold, it was really well done. And again, the crowd was super hot for everything. It was, it was a very, very good match. Um, First match of the night was TNT title match between uh, Wardlow and Luchasaurus. The match itself wasn't, Great. Uh, and it was another title change. Luchasaurus won and became the TNT champion. That TNT title has been bounced around so much over the last couple of years. It's changed hands. I don't even know how many times. Kevin Kelly mentioned that um, it's it's been defended something like 75 times and it's changed hands 15 times. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So Hopefully Luchasaurus gets to actually keep the TNT title for a while and, and, and is able to kind of settle that down. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of Luchasaurus, but his dynamic with Christian Cage works really well. And the deal they set up in this match where Christian uh, cheats to help Luchasaurus beat Wardlow and win the title, and then Christian grabs the title belt and holds it over his head like he's the one who won the title. If that's the angle that they go with with these two where Luchasaurus is actually the champion, but Christian Cage is the heel manager who's acting like he's the champion. I think they could have something there. So hopefully they are allowed to sort of run with that for a while and see if that works. Because I, I, I like that in theory. Um, Miro is back. One of my favorite guys from a couple years ago. Uh, who then disappeared for a variety of reasons. He comes back and gets basically a glorified squash versus Tony Nese. Felt like this took a little bit longer than it needed to, but they gave Tony Nese a little bit of time on the microphone before the match, which gave him a chance to give people a sense of who he is more so than I think he's ever gotten in AEW, at least in a spot where people might have been watching. And Miro comes out looking like a killer. You know, he ends up killing this guy, which is good, which is what... Miro needs to be presented as he needs to be presented as, as a big, brutal, almost impossible to beat guy. And hopefully uh, they stick with it with Miro. And hopefully they also present powerhouse Hobbs the same way when he gets to wrestle on the show uh, at some point in the near future. Cause that's also, I think the way Hobbs should be presented. It's just a, a fucking killer. Um, there was a match between Andrade and buddy Matthews. I didn't think the match was that great, but it was very hard hitting and the crowd was super into it. So, you know, I can't really complain about that. There was a women's tag team match, uh, Tony Storm and Ruby Soho versus Willow Nightingale and Sky Blue. That was a good match. I'm finally starting to see something in Sky Blue. I haven't really seen it in her before. I know some people have been really high on her and think that she's a great young talent. I haven't thought she was bad, but I just haven't seen anything special about her. She just has seemed like one of the many interchangeable, younger, less over kind of underneath members of, of the women's roster. This match, I feel like she actually broke out a little bit. She looked better than I've ever seen her. Um, part of that might have been that she was in front of that super hot crowd, which is also her hometown crowd. She's from Chicago as well. Uh, the finish, I wasn't super crazy about. Uh, the business with the spray can, Tony Storm comes in with the spray can and is going to spray 
uh, I think Sky in the face and then Sky jumps out of the way or dodges and, and Tony accidentally sprays her own partner Ruby with the cannon. It doesn't really make sense unless we assume that Tony just didn't care about getting disqualified and was going to spray her opponent with a spray can in full view of the referee. Um, and then it just didn't work out. But uh, Sky Blue got the pin and looked good getting the pin. I'm a big fan of Willow Nightingale. I think she's fantastic. I love her look. I love her style. So it's always nice to see her being used in a very prominent spot. Um, more general comments on the show. They have a two-person announce team. Thank God. And it's two announcers that we have not seen or heard in AEW before, although they are veteran announcers from other companies. It's Kevin Kelly on the play-by-play -play and Nigel McGinnis uh, in the color commentator slash analyst role. I think they both did fairly well the first time out. There were a few awkward moments with Kevin Kelly mispronouncing wrestlers' names and mistiming his throws to commercial breaks once or twice, but hopefully those will smooth out um, as just time goes on and they get more comfortable in this company and, and doing this show. A two-person announced team, I think, is the way to go. I, I am not a fan of... of three or four especially person announced teams i think especially like a four person announced team that they've had on aw rampage regularly for the past many months it's just ridiculous two announcers that's all you need you need a play-by-play -play person and you need a color commentator or an analyst that's it that's the way to go and that's what they've gone with for collision hopefully it stays that way hopefully they don't add a third person they don't need it i really wish they would switch to two person announced teams on their other shows as well maybe do uh um, Excalibur and Taz as the announced team for Dynamite because they did a very good job as the announced team together on the on the YouTube shows that AEW uh, did until recently. I think they're a good team, just the two of them. And then for Friday night for the Rampage show, maybe do Tony Schiavone as a play-by-play -play guy because Tony Schiavone is just completely lost as like the third wheel on the announced team on Dynamite. He doesn't need to be there. There's nothing for him to do. But make Tony the play-by-play -play guy and give him a good color commentator, maybe uh, uh, Renee Paquette or Stokely Hathaway, you know, as the as the color commentator, and make them the announce team for Rampage. Maybe you have something there, but a two person announce team is the way to go. Uh, Jim Ross sat in for the main event of Collision. Uh, it, he he had lost his voice and he was injured from taking a fall earlier, so there were mitigating circumstances to that. But even so, Jim Ross wasn't good. Jim Ross hasn't been good on the air for. Any of the time that he has been with AEW, I feel like his days as an on-air commentator are long, long over, and he's only being used for his name recognition, and I really wish they would just move him to a backstage role and let him retire from commentary with a little bit of dignity, because he has not been remotely good as an on-air announcer for many, many years, since before he came to join AEW. Uh, overall, though... My opinion of the show is very positive. This was a very encouraging show, uh, a refreshingly different presentation from AEW. It's It felt more serious. It felt more consistent stylistically and tonally. It didn't have the everyone does everything bullshit that uh, is so exhausting in most other AEW shows that makes everything feel cheap and meaningless uh, nothing in the show really was outstanding other than Punk's opening promo, and and the main event was very good. I wouldn't call it like an all-time classic or anything, but the main event six-man was, was very good. But nothing in between those two things was terrible. Nothing sucked, and the overall presentation was very strong and felt very different from all of AEW's other shows. So it was a very promising show and one that makes me look forward and want to watch the next episode of AEW Collision. So that's really what you're hoping for when you're producing wrestling TV or when you're producing any kind of TV show. You want the audience to watch it and go, you know what? Maybe it wasn't perfect. I had certain issues with it here and there, but overall, I'm interested in what comes next. That is me with AEW Collision. So as long as I feel that way, I'll keep watching it. And as long as I keep watching it and I keep having things to say about it that I think will be of interest to some of you who watch my videos, I'll keep doing these every week. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, I know some of you are also wrestling fans and you've, you've said, I wish you would talk about wrestling more often. So as long as Collision keeps holding my interest and seems like a fun, worthwhile show, and as long as I think I have something useful to say about it, 
maybe this can be a way I can regularly talk about a little bit of wrestling with you. If you are a wrestling fan and you watched AEW Collision and you have your own thoughts and opinions on the show, if you agree with me or disagree with me or whatever, please leave a comment. I would love to read what you have to say. Also, don't forget you can support this channel by becoming a member by clicking the join button or by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives. I appreciate all the support from my viewers and especially from my regular supporters and I will see you next week for another one of these as I offer some more notes and thoughts on AEW Collision. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.